Good morning. It is good to be together this morning to worship God, to connect with each other and be in the presence of Jesus, who is with us always. Whether you have been here once before or countless times, I'm glad you are here. Part of our worship this morning is going to include hearing from Sarah and Kurt Fenton about the Mennonite Church USA Convention and Delegate Session, which was held at the beginning of July in Kansas City. Mennonite Convention is our large church gathering that happens every two years. Now, I have only attended one convention, that was in Phoenix, 2013, um, but from that one time, I learned that it is a great reminder of the vastness of the Mennonite Church, which I think we sometimes forget, especially here in central Illinois. So I thought um, it would be interesting as we are gathering here this morning in our worship to hear what other Mennonite churches are doing, possibly right at this moment. C3, um, it's one of, I believe, the largest Mennonite churches, is located in Hampton, Virginia. They are likely concluding or have just wrapped up their online worship. That's something that they do every fourth and fifth Sunday of the month. They do meet in person on the first, second, and third Sundays. Hope Well Mennonite Church is also beginning their worship service in Coutts, Indiana. And just 34 miles away from us, Roanoke Mennonite Church is starting their worship gathering. Now I'm going to share a few more churches as time goes on throughout our service. As I was looking up all of these churches this week, um, it usually meant finding their website or their Facebook page, reading a little bit about them, and sometimes I even watched part of a previous worship service if they had a recording. And there's something I learned while doing this little project, you might say, and that is we're not as different as we might think. We might have different worship styles or um, different songs that we sing or different orders to our service, but we all gather, we all pray, we all sing, we read scripture, and we share together. There are differences, of course, but we are all praising God and following Jesus in our communities. So to bring us into worship this morning, as Psalm 47 tells us, Come, everyone, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King over all the earth. Praise him with a psalm. Dale, would you lead us in singing? This is a very new venture for me in song leading. Um, I've not had the opportunity to lead in the traditions of unaccompanied uh, hymn singing, other than in camp settings or whatever. So uh, I've picked some songs that I think I have either heard here or um, would be hopefully familiar to you in in that. And I would ask that you would uh, joyfully lift your voices in praise uh, so that you can drown mine out. And uh, I I don't have a pitch pipe. And so um, I've borrowed uh, Marge Weaver's auto harp And that's going to be our pitch pipe for the day. So let's sing together uh, out of voices together. Number 95, praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. Praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. Praise the Lord, oh, hallelujah. From the heavens, praise God's name. Praise the Lord, our great Creator. All you angels, praise, proclaim. All you hosts together, praising. Sun and moon and stars on high. 
Praise the Lord, our heavens of heavens, and the floods above the sky. God, we praise you, hallelujah, for your name alone is high. And your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted, our above the and sky. Let them praise the Lord Creator, they were made for God's command who established them forever, whose decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise your maker, raging seas, you creatures all. Fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear the call. God, we praise you, hallelujah, for your name alone is high. And your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All you fruitful trees and cedars, every hill and mountain high, creeping things, swing beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, crowns of earth from every nation, rulers, great earth judges all. Praise together, all you people, aged ones and children small. God, we praise you, hallelujah, for your name alone is high. And your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted, and your glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. And uh, another one, hopefully it's on the uh, Mennonite hit parade. No. <laughs> It's, uh, but it's, it's, it's a good, solid song and hymn. 101, sing praise to God who reigns. And we'll try and get the chord here. Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation. The God of war and God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul is filled, and every faithless murmur still to God all praise and glory. What in almighty power has made God's gracious horse he keepeth by morning glow or evening shade God's watchful eye ne'er sleepeth within the shelter of God's might Lo, all is just and all is right. To God all praise and glory. Our God is never far away through our grief distressing. And ever present help and stay our peace and joy and blessing as with a mother's tender hand 
God gently leads the chosen band to God all oh, praise and glory. Then all oh, my glad some way along I sing aloud thy praises that all oh, may hear the grateful song my joy son wearied raises be joyful in your god my heart with soul and body bear your part to god all oh, praise and glory Let us offer up a prayer for the offering that has been collected. Comforting and challenging God, these offerings are our meager attempts to serve you instead of wealth. They are small actions we take to let go of our worry and trust in your provision. They are our witness to the world that we want to seek your reign first. Please take what we offer God and do what you do. Feed and clothe nourish and love, bring peace to your people. Amen. I'm gonna come on back here and we're gonna have a little conversation. Boys, can you come over here? <laughs> So, how many meetings a month do you think usually happens here at the church building? Can you take a guess? Four? Do you have a guess? No, okay. Well, there are all different kinds of meetings that happen. There are Bible studies. The men Bible study, I think, meets weekly. Um, there are prayer groups, like the women's prayer group. There are ministry groups like Mennonite Women. You guys know you've been there before. Um, there's board meetings that, like I had one just this past week, where we talk about big things for the church, like how we can all work together for God. There are commission meetings where we talk about lots of big and little things, like how we use our money, ways we can help each other and follow Jesus, and planning worship services. And I don't know if you guys realize it, you two have actually been in some of these meetings before. <laughs> you've, sometimes you've popped your head in on the screen while I'm in a Zoom meeting. Or when you were really little and you were babies, I would have pastoral team meetings and a lot of times you guys would sleep on the floor. <laughs> and while I know that sometimes it doesn't make sense to you why I have to go to these meetings, there's a lot of really neat stuff that comes from these meeting times. So I wanted to be able to show you some pictures today, but we don't actually take very many pictures during meetings because it's kind of a lot of talking. But Sarah and Kurt are going to talk about a really big meeting they went to um, with lots of people from other Mennonite churches across the United States. And there are a few pictures here from that meeting that I'm gonna show you. Sorry, grownups, I didn't put them on the screen for you to see too. Um, so we can look at these pictures here, and you can see how many people there were. Weldon, can you spread these out for me? You can see how many people there were and a little bit about what it was like to be at this really big meeting that they had. So just like at the meetings that happened in our church building, I know. This meeting that Kurt and Sarah went to also had Bible study. There was prayer. There was ministry groups. I think I even saw some comforter nodding. Can you find that picture? Yep, just like our Mennonite women do and like we had a big comforter blitz. Um, there's also time for people to talk about how we as churches all across the country can work together for God. 
And they talk about lots of other big and little things like money stuff, ways we can help each other and follow Jesus, and ideas for worship. Did you see that there's even some kids here? They had, I think, a butterfly on stage because they talked about transformation. And they even play games, too. Maybe we need to start playing games in our meetings some. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and pray. Can you pray? God, our Father, thank you for the church that we get to be a part of and for showing us the way. Help us to all follow Jesus every day of our lives. Amen. Get your Bible. So while we transition to the scripture reading, which um, I'm actually going to do from the back here, Walden is going to help me out. But while we get ready for that, I'm guessing that Plains Mennonite Church in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, um, that's another Mennonite church part of MCUSA, is nearing the end of their worship service, which from their website um, said that they were going to be having outdoors today if the weather worked out, so. Okay, so our scripture reading is from Acts 15. Um, we're gonna be reading verses one and two, six through 12, and then verse 22. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were, dis were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The apostles and elders met to consider this question after much after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that Gentiles might hear from my lips. The heart showed that he, the message of the gospel and believed God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate be between us and now them, for he purified their hearts by faith. N now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles, a yoke that never we, neither we nor our ancestors, grace of have be able to hear no we believe it. it is through the grace of our lord jesus that we are saved just as they are the whole assembly became silent as they listened to barnabas and paul telling about the signs and wonders god had done among the gentiles through them then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. We thought we'd save paper, but it may be a little more trouble than it's worth. We'll find out. The scripture from Acts 15 tells the story of God's way, or church looking for God's way through the issues of circumcision, food laws, and what the law meant for Greek followers of Jesus. It's old hat to us, but that's, that was new to them. We can imagine, but of course we don't get to listen in all the discussions and debates that went on in the hallway. Imagine what goes on in the foyer here. Um, I'd love to have heard those uh, discussions. 
But the decisions that came from that conference, and there were others in the Bible that we hear about in the book of Acts too, they were so momentous that they ended up in scripture. I don't think any of our meetings are gonna end up like that. But they're still important. Um, from the beginning, the church has decided, has gathered to decide issues of faith and life and share our common faith with each other and to form and maintain relationships. And most of us can probably recall meetings that we've been a part of. I'm just curious, how many of you have attended a uh, national Mennonite convention at some time in your life? Oh goodness. Um, more than one? Two? Okay. Um, I guess we're junkies, we've done several. My first one was, uh, in Harrisonburg, uh, Virginia in 1973 when I was in college. And I had a, a bit role in a, in a um, musical play or something like that. I don't re even remember much about it. But um, one thing about this last meeting, Sarah, how do you tell when somebody's been to a convention? What? Huh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> We're getting old. And the music in the, the uh, uh, worship sessions was really loud. But it was good. We really learned some things and we enjoyed it. So, When you have to provide a room for people who need to escape from the immediate vicinity and provide earplugs, I'm just saying, isn't there another solution? But I digress. Uh, the Mennonite Church in the U.S. held um, such a meeting as was talked about in Acts uh, the week of July 4th. Every two years, MCUSA delegates, youth and youth delegates, and adults get together for worship, learning, and decision making. We didn't discuss kosher and we didn't discuss circumcision, but there were some important decisions made for the life of the church. Uh, we'll go briefly through the why and how of decisions that were made and end with some of the highlights for us from worship and teaching at the convention. Okay, Paul. Um, first, we'd like to show you a quick graphic of the organization of Mennonite Church USA. Now this, it's a little hard to read maybe because we had to mess with it to get it to fit on the screen. Basically, the structure of the church is um, bottom up. The um, congregation, the delegates, um, and the executive board provide direction from the bottom up to the conferences and then to the, the national church. Um, as you know, there are area conferences. We're part of Illinois Mennonite Conference. Um, in the whole Mennonite Church USA, there are 556 congregations. Now, to maintain representation in between um, the every two-year delegate sessions, um, there's something called the Constituency Leaders Council, which meets twice a year to provide direction to the executive board on the function of the church. I'm getting away from my thing here. I might have missed something. Um, the other thing that you see here are um, in the blue box are racial ethnic groups and constituency groups. These are special groups that um, the executive board at the direction of the delegates Sorry. Um, these constituency groups are groups that the delegates have instructed the executive board to put together to provide input and um, direction um, as the work of the church goes on. And each conference has representatives on the constituency leaders council. It's usually the conference minister and at this point Illinois doesn't have one. We're looking for one. And um, oftentimes it's the moderator and some other groups. Daryl Miller has been representing Illinois Conference on the CLC. This year was a little bit unique in that uh, in years past, the delegates had to meet as delegates while everybody else was attending workshops and seminars and things like that. So this year they separated those and the Monday evening through Thursday evening was uh, 
strictly worship, learning, meeting, um, doing the things that people attending conventions do. And then uh, Friday and Saturday morning, uh, the delegates gathered to uh, do delegate business. And uh, a little bit about that, um, something I really appreciate. Um, we didn't sit in rows. I don't know if you, if you attended a convention years, many years ago, people sat in rows and every once in a while somebody was given the opportunity to go to a microphone or something like that. Well, we sat around tables. But you can't sit with your friends, your spouse, um, people from your congregation. Or your conference. Or your conference, really, yeah. Right. Um, which really I appreciate because it, uh, before you um, are asked to vote on something, you hear perspectives from people quite a bit different from yourself in a lot of ways. And that I really appreciate. I've wondered already, or I was wondering, especially as I was thinking about this, if we had our business meetings in the basement around tables and you couldn't sit with your spouse or your sibling, how that would work. Anyway, just a thought. I should have refreshed my memory on this, but there were 300, give or take, youth. There were, was it 15 or 1,800 adults? I can't remember, and I should have looked it up. Anyway, so, you know, while we thought that it was all meadows all the time, about Friday evening, I began to realize there's an awful lot of people around here. Young people wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats and sparkly clothes. What is the deal? Is this prom? No, that's not right. Homekeeping? Time's not right. So I thought, well, I don't know. And when we walked to supper, there were these cars double and triple parked through the streets, people unloading suitcases, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? You know, I thought, oh well, whatever. And Saturday morning, Daryl Miller enlightened me. He said, Taylor Swift is in town. I'm like, oh, it's the Swifties. We're not Swifties. And then I saw a hotel housekeeper with one of those adhesive wind rollers rolling the carpet trying to get the glitter up. I thought, oh, you poor lady. Just forget it. <laughs> so that, that was kind of interesting. And as the Mennonites were leaving town, more Swifties were coming in. It's pretty interesting. Um, historically, the delegate assembly has happened every two years, and that's um, designated by the bylaws. Um, delegates of both congregations and conferences get together and consider resolutions brought by MCUSA leaders and other members to be considered. Um, the first resolution that was considered this year was to move the delegate assembly and the convention uh, to a three-year cycle, and the reason for this is to reduce costs and to give the um, MCUSA staff more time to work on things that were specified by the delegates that need to happen. There was a lot of discussion, um, a lot of discussion. Delegates supported this, supported the concept, but overwhelmingly, at least I heard at the table that I was sitting at, but we like to get together every two years. We like this, we want to see people, we want to get together. And what about the youth? If we only meet every th three years, then high school students only get to go one time. So, um, and they felt that that would be harmful for our unity and our cohesiveness. So in the end, um, there was a vote taken and the resolution passed at 65.5% and 67% is required um, for passing because this was amending the bylaws. Um, I know that MCUSA staff were kind of disappointed and I think they probably thought, oh no, you know, how are we gonna do all this work? So, you know, there's some things to be addressed and to, to think about. The other business that we did, um, Everance and MHA, which is formerly known as uh, Mennonite Health Association, have been agencies of uh, Mennonite Church USA. Of course, they serve other 
Anabaptist related denominations. In fact, as time has gone on, they're serving more other denominations. And discussions with the uh, leadership of MCUSA over the past probably couple years, they thought that, well, there might be a better way, a better way to do this. Rather than having them directly report to MCUSA that they be uh, what the term they came up with, I think, was mission partners, min ministry partners. Yeah. And they talked about how that might go and realized that there needed to be some bylaw changes, some technical fixes, which only delegates could do. So that, it sounds simple, but there was a lot of uh, discussion and informing and making sure that everybody was on the same page, understanding everything. Um, the delegates voted on two resolutions to accomplish that, to change the governance and to um, also tweak what it means to be a ministry partner. So those passed overwhelmingly once we had the discussions. And overall, I think it's a good thing. MCU, I say, should be on the same footing as other denominations, Church of the Brethren, LMC, others that uh, work with those two entities. And there still will be representation on their boards from MCUSA as there is from other denominations as well. So really, it's one of those meet federal, regula federal and state regulation, make the wheels turn more smoothly, but it takes time and we put the time in. So that's, if you see something about that, that's a nutshell of what had happened there. And, and that'll probably, um, yeah. they had already started working on um, charters and bylaws and things like that related to that change, but the changes will probably um, start beginning to roll out this fall. It doesn't appear to me that we'll see any change in uh, form and function as far as Everence services, for example, for those of us who um, use Everence. We'd like to talk a little bit about uh, our experience in worship, learning, uh, workshops, and things like that, recognizing that if any of you had been there, you'd have probably gone to different places, different things, and you would have heard different things if you sat beside us in the sessions we were in, too. So just a little bit about that to give you a flavor and some things that we brought home and that are still meaningful to us after two months. And also, I would say, we have this uh, booklet, that, the program booklet. You look at it every morning. What am I going to go to? I, I'd like to do this but I'd also like to do these two other things in this time slot. And a lot of forced choices, but uh, again, it was kind of like not just drinking from one fire hose, but having to choose which fire hose to drink from. And uh, a little overwhelming, but it was a really good experience too. Uh I went to several uh, workshops. I would say the one that made the most impression on me and that provided the take-home message for me personally was um, a session um, put on by John Carlson, who is the new moderator of MCUSA. He did a workshop and then had a Thursday evening worship session on the same topic. Um, some highlights of this, are, can you remember when you were wrong? Um, he told about a family discussion of their move to Lancaster in 2014. And John said eight years ago, his spouse said nine years ago. And so John was counting his fingers, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then when the ninth finger went up, he had the feeling not of being wrong, but that realizing he's wrong. And his takeaway was everyone is wrong more than they know without knowing it. Um, and the takeaway from the seminar they went to is everybody's wrong all the time. Um, he had a, a visual illustration that he had us do that I can't reproduce. I didn't get all the script written down, but it was essentially an optical illusion. And he said, see, you're wrong. You're all wrong. 
So that was my takeaways. Remember that everybody's wrong all the time and to realize that and realize there are different perspectives. My takeaway from it, and again, I, this, is, this is one thing that you can, and I would recommend it. It's on YouTube, and you do Menocon John, J-O-N, Carlson, and it comes up. But, uh, yeah. It's just, knowledge isn't just what we know but how we know it. Um, in beginning with the, you, when we started really understanding a lot more in science, maybe 1850 on, um, things have really gotten muddy. Um, so we basically grab onto what we think is right and hang on. And sometimes this is necessary, sometimes it's really important, sometimes it kind of gets us in trouble. Now, if you're going to say, like, uh, well, when you do the counting down, instead of doing that exercise and, oh my goodness, I'm wrong, um, if he just said to his spouse, for instance, um, if you really believe we lived in Lancaster for eight years, then we need a divorce. Now, that's... What sometimes, honestly, sometimes what we do. And if we do things like that, we probably live to regret it. And again, this is paraphrasing John a little bit, uh, and bear with me. He says, I can be in relationship with those I think are wrong because we both need, here, just a minute, let's do it this way because we both need transformation. God is restoring and working on us both. So instead of the objective knowing, at least for the moment, until we all figure it out, it's about love. We don't know in order to love, we love in order to know. Now I know you can take that down some tra rabbit trails and go places it isn't meant to go, but and he used this passage from the scripture from on the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it was said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Our tendency, and this is how John phrased it, our tendency is to distance ourselves from people we perceive to be not perfect. But following Jesus is not being in right relationship with, with people who are actively wrong. We know it and they haven't figured it out somehow. And we all need er this error correction mechanism that God calls community. And transformation happens when we are in not just communities that are clones of ourselves, but that are more diverse and not in echo chambers. Echo chambers are dangerous. Um, next slide, Paul. This is a quote that um, John put up during his sermon on Thursday evening, and um, I think it sums uh, what we were talking about. But you, when hearing your brother or sister speak something that is strange to you, do not immediately contradict it, but hear if it be true that you might also accept it. If you cannot understand it, you should not judge them. And if they consider you to be slightly in error, consider whether your error might be even greater. Um, this is a quote from Hans Denk, and um, Kirk can tell you who that was. He's more of a student of um, biblical history than I am, but this is an um, Anabaptist leader. Didn't necessarily agree with, my, with Menno Simons, um, but for me, this is a good take home message. Again, Wednesday morning, uh, we heard from uh, Diane Garcia, who's pastor of Iglesia Cristiana Roca de Refugio in uh, San Jose, uh, sorry, San, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, her text was this, uh, a couple passages from the book of Ruth, the story of Ruth and Naomi. Uh, she started with something about children's stories. Um, she has... Uh, twins, a boy and a girl, and about when they were about five, 
they started asking questions, as children will do at that age. Um, why are some people so nice and some people really aren't so nice? And so the um, answer that mom came up with was, well, God has given us each a bottle of love. And God, when we talk to God and when we read scripture, that bottle is filled up. And sometimes some people's bottles of love are a little bit low. Others have plenty and plenty to share. So sometimes, sometime later, and this is, I'm trying to tell the story she told her, she did a much better job of it. Um, son hits daughter. They got into some kind of scrap of the five-year-old's will. And when she went to talk to him about it, well, mom, my bottle of love is empty. And she realized that maybe uh, the analogy had played uh, out to the extent that it could. Uh, she talked about how Ruth had given up when uh, in the part of the story where um, the men are all had all died and um, Naomi and her daughters-in-law were headed back to, uh, to uh, Bethlehem from Moab. And um, Naomi says, no, you guys go back to your families. I'll go on alone. And of course, we know the story. Um, Orpha, is that right? Went, uh, went back. But Ruth says, um, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. And basically, she was given up everything that she could have in her own country with her own family. Nobody knows what it would have been like. But to be an outsider and a woman alone in Bethlehem, and we know the rest of the story about that. And we know how it ended with uh, how Boaz befriended Ruth and risked his own standing in the community to, to care for those women. And in her telling of it, when he went to talk to his uh, relative who was a closer relative and not named, and, and as she put it, what's his name, passed on redeeming Malan's land and marrying Ruth in order to protect his own inheritance and his own children. And of course the people responded when Boaz announced what was going on. We're witnesses. Um, she told a little story in closing about uh, two um, immigrant families in her own congregation that one was a recent immigrant family from Africa. They really struggled to find a place for them that they could go and meet their needs. They finally found a, a room in a cheap motel for a week or so until they could figure things out. And then another family came just on their heels from uh, South America. And they ended up in the same situation Resources that they normally relied on were not available. So they ended up also in that motel. And with just a few minutes notice, the African family was uh, helping the new family get settled, uh, gave them things they didn't have to give, information, and cared for them with virtually no resources. Um, again, her take home, God's love is not in a bottle. It's not a commodity we dispense when we th to whom we think it's worthy, but a force that we participate in. God acts, transforms, we participate, and we're transformed along with those around us. And I guess I'll be chewing on that for a while. Um, you can also find her presentation on, on YouTube, um, Metacon 23, Diane with two N's, Garcia. And they're also, I think, both uh, referenced in uh, the Meta World issue, or Anabaptist World issue after uh, the convention, too. 
as we said, we did go to um, other seminars. Um, again, it was Monday through Thursday, or Tuesday through Thursday, um, all day, all the time. Um, flaming introvert that at least I am, by the end of the day, I was just done, ready to be by myself. But it was good. I really enjoy and appreciate getting together with fellow believers um, in the wider Mennonite church, meeting new people, hearing hearing from others, learning about what work they're doing, different perspectives. Um, some of the seminars I attended, I attended by um, a couple by Michael Danner, um, basically about church leaders working together with pastors in the congregation, congregation, and again, John Carlson's seminar on how to be wrong. As far as things that I attended, I did a couple that Michael Danner, who's the, he, he works with the um, uh, Church Vitality Office in Elkhart. He was formerly our conference minister here. Um, he had a couple titles. One was Making Decisions Together, and another one was Turning Your Church Toward Engaged Mission. Uh, Doug Luganbill, who, has, who is the conference minister for uh, Central District, uh, had one Tending Healthy Pastor Congregation Relationships, which I, there was a few take home things from that as well. And uh, another one that, this is one that I could really see us in. Um, it was given by Randall Kaler and uh, S. Roy Kaufman. Uh, Randall is a pastor currently and Roy Kaufman is retired both from South Dakota, I think Freeman, if I believe. Um, the title was Conjuring Hope in Rural Spaces. And um, I won't, with time being what it is, I won't go into much of that. But that is something that I hope to, from the scribbled notes that I took, I hope to make some use of as well. Uh, finally, one of the last uh, worship sessions involved a panel of several people from around the country um, responding to a set of questions and their experience of church and such. And I'll just leave you with those questions. I won't go into the my notes from the uh, responses because I'm not sure I've, they were all so clear. But the questions are, when is your church at its best? How has the church and your congregation changed? What are the top three things that the church should be focused on? And what is your hope for the future? Um, we hope this has been helpful. Uh, if you have questions for us, ask us. Um, we may not always have an answer, but appreciate the opportunity to, again, think about this and bring up some of these things for ourselves um, two months after the fact. So thank you. We've come to another experimental time in music. Um, I'm going to try and accompany this song. Uh, it was written by Eddie Espinoza, who was part of the um, Vineyard organization. And uh, I don't know the date of when he wrote this, uh, both lyric and music, but it's it's one that I've sung before, and hopefully you've heard it uh, on it, Change My Heart, O oh God. And um, we will attempt to, or hopefully you'll help me sing uh, as well as I try and play the auto harp. It's, that, that's also a new venture for me as well in music. All right, let's see if we can go.
Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. I am the clay. I've lost my music. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not enough hands. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fold it and we'll, we'll go there. All right. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Let's try and sing that one more time and see if I can do a little better with that on there. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may be like you. May that be our prayer, that God will change our hearts. We're going to be getting ready for the um, sharing time, and as we do that, Another um, church in California, Upland Peace Church in Upland, California, is in the midst of their 8 a.m. Hispanic service that they are in the Pacific time zone. So. Uh, this is kind of a benediction song, one that I learned uh, way back when I was in Goodfield. It was sung every week at the closing of the uh, Sunday School Assembly. So yeah, it's, uh, let's stand. And do you want them to remain standing for the Bible verse? All right. And remain standing for the uh, Bible verse of the month on, on that. God be with you till we meet again. Loving counsels guide uphold you. Shepherds fold you. 
God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. We are preparing to go out from our worship, and as we are leaving our worship, Beth L. Mennonite Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, is beginning their worship. Please join me in the Bible memory verse as our benediction. <laughs> this could be a test. Do you have it memorized? <laughs> Okay, how about this? I'll give you a part and then you can repeat it. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, verse 18. Go living in the power of the transforming God.